number, 2008, has a, has a positive ring about it, and I think it's going to be a good year. A good year not only for us personally, hopefully, but also for us as a church. Uh, it's amazing how, how things happen. You know, we were asked to go and, and babysit us for some friends yesterday, and now the, ch the children are only three and a half and, and 30 months old. But so many people make it hard for their lives, and that the husband of those, or the father of the two children, is involved in alcohol and uh, and it, it just makes it a shame because when the parents come home, there wasn't a happy atmosphere uh, in that family. So hence, we spent some time just counselling and talking with them. And I thought, well, what a way to start a year, already having trouble uh, amongst a family. But it was great that God put us in that situation whereby we, we could help them. I'd like just to, to refer to a, a story that we had out of our Sabbath school um, last quarter. And you know how at the end of each week we have a, have a little story. Well, there was one about Mickey's, Mickey's mission, and I don't know whether any of you remember that mission, but uh, Mickey was from Virginia, and um, he was on, the, on deacon duty in his church, and as the uh, members or visitors came up the steps to the church, he said in his long Virginian drawl, and I won't try to mimic it, uh, he said, if you want to find something, you're going to find it. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? If you want to find something, you, you will. And then he went on to say, say to the people, that uh, the visitors that were coming in, he went on to say, I just can't stop talking about Jesus. And I can't help but look for people to find to talk about Jesus. And I thought, well, what a great way that would be if we made that our resolution for the new year. Because, you know, we all start off with making New Year's resolutions, and by the time it gets to the fourth day, a lot of them have been broken already. So I don't even bother about that. But wouldn't that be a great, a great thing for us to do, to make a resolution that when we get up in the morning and we have our morning worship, Lord, will you please lead somebody into our life or my life today who wants to know about you? Wouldn't that be great? That'll help us grow too, won't it? I've got a few nods. Oh, I want a few amens here too, you know, because that's, that's our mission, isn't it? That's what we're here for. And I'd like to thank Nigel too for leading out in the Sabbath school. You did a good job, Nigel. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, so it would be just fantastic to, to be able to, to have that. And that is a prayer of Mary Ann and I quite often. Sometimes when we're busy, we kind of leave that one out of our prayer. But uh, on the day that we prayed that, um, Lord, please lead someone into our lives today. It was when Brother Smith put the contact um, name and address of Bev Somner in our hands. So, and she's here today after three years. So, you know, Lord can use us no matter what. And as our brother said this morning, there's so many opportunities that we have out there to be a witness for God. And I think of too, you know, it's also an inspiration when we, when we come to church, when I see Aunt Lucy here every Sabbath. You know, she's here even for Sabbath school. And for a person who's 93 going on 94, that's an inspiration in itself, isn't it? Right. I'd like us to turn to our scriptures this morning to the book of Hebrews. That's one of my favorite books in the Bible. And it comes uh, from chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, Verse six, and of course, this is the the chapter in the Bible, which is the faith chapter. Or it's called the faith chapter. And as we read together, um, verse six, it says simply, "But without faith, it is, it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him." Again, but without faith. It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And of course, a lot of us say, yeah, I've got faith. Yeah, I believe. But when we go to the verse 1 uh, of chapter 11, it explains what faith really is. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
Now, when I read that verse, I said, well, how am I going to explain that to someone out there on the street to have faith? And it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And we all know that God just spoke the world into existence. He didn't need any matter or material. He just spoke and the world existed. And that's what faith is, to believe that he did that. That's where our faith is grounded on, that God made the world and that he sent his son. And it says, it is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So what is our faith? Where does our faith lie? In Jesus. And a bit, add, add to that a bit more? Amen. Jesus returned. That's, our, that's where our faith lies. And it says, through faith, in verse 2, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do simply appear. Okay? So that things were, which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So like I said before, God spoke and, uh, and the world came into his ex existence. We never knew we, anything before that. God made the world and it existed from that time onwards. When we, uh, I'd like just to also now to turn to um, the book of Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and it says here, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith, something that we believe in, something that's not made with hands, comes from hearing the word of God. Okay, so if we're, if we're not hearing the word of God, we're not going to have faith, true or false. We've got to be constantly in communion with God for him to strengthen our faith. And if we go up to verse 7 of the same chapter, it says, All who shall, oh no, sorry, in verse 8. But what said it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe thine heart, thy God, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. And that's, that's very true, isn't it? We have a wonderful faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and a wonderful love for him. We know he's coming soon, so we shouldn't be ashamed to tell others of that wonderful hope that we have. You know, we should go out there with uh, all the strength that the Spirit gives us. He said, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. For whosoever shall, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We are all become born into the, into the church of God, the body of Christ, and we are all being, have all been ordained as priests. So we have the opportunity to go and witness and tell people about this wonderful truth that we have. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. That is the good news that we've got to preach in the year 2008 and further on. And it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who have believed our report? They just have to hear it. Whether they believe it or not, that's up to the Holy Spirit to convict them. But we've got to go and preach the word. So that the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, even, even back in the Old Testament times, the prophet Isaiah, he announced the day of the Lord with a, with a reference to the destruction of Babylon by the Medes. He said, Wail for the day of the Lord is near as destruction 
from the Almighty that will come. In the context of this impending historical judgment, Isaiah describes the final day of the Lord, which will be accompanied by the darkening of the sun, of the moon and stars, and which will punish the world for its evil and wicked for their iniquity. The sense of distance for that final day of the Lord is sometimes expressed in Isaiah and other prophets by indefinite phrases such as the latter days in the days after. And if he was preaching that all those years ago, how much closer now are we to the coming of our Lord and Saviour? It is interesting to note also that the New Testament writers wrote regarding nearness and a distance um, in regards to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For example, Paul writes to the Romans, For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day it is at hand. And that's, he wrote that over 2,000 years ago, so we're that much closer. Paul knew it, it was um, thinkable, unthinkable sorry, to, to set a date uh, for the... Um, for the coming of our, of our Lord. He urges us to keep awake and to be sober in the book of um, Thessalonians. There's also other examples of how we are to wait. It says, be patient and do not grumble for the coming of the Lord is at the doors. He also urges in the book of James to keep sane and sober because of all these things are at hand. The last book of the Bible opens by announcing we must soon take, uh, these things must soon take place and closes by affirming, surely I am coming soon. We are not to become dismayed at the fact that that kingdom or the, our Lord hasn't come already. The time involved in reaching the whole world with the gospel as well as the words as then implying the elapse of considerable time before the second coming. Distance is also implied by the time required for the fulfilment of various pre-advent conditions, predicting such an intensification of warfare, natural disasters, increased wickedness. A sense of distance is particularly suggested by the statement that even after the fulfilment of these conditions, the end is not yet. Several of Christ's parables point to a long waiting time between his death and his return. Matthew directly links the Olivet Discourse with the parables of the faithful and the unfaithful servants, the ten virgins and the talents, all of which suggest the elapse of considerable time before the Lord's return. The unfaithful servant said, My master is delayed and began living immoral and intemperately life. The master rebukes the servant not because of his awareness of the delay, but rather because of his irresponsible con conduct during the delay. In the parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom was delayed and they all slumbered and slept. The focus is on the conduct of the virgins during the delay of the bridegroom. The same point is made in the parable of the talents when it says, Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. A similar parable of the pounds, according to Luke, was related by Christ because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. For us to correct this misunderstanding, the parable speaks of a nobleman who went into a far country and then returned to settle accounts with his servants. Here again we have that distance, destina destination of, that the nobleman suggests that his return might, have a long, might be a way long off in time. Other parables found in Matthew 13, such as the tears of the mustard seed and of the leaven, also suggest the possibility of a long lapse of time before the end. The tears which represents the unbelievers are to coexist side by side, um, with the believers until the very end. The mustard seed, which also stands for the small band of Christ's followers, is to become an impressive group, the leaven which typifies the kingdom of God, hidden initially 
is to become manifest. The elements of growth develop in manifest, manifestation which are respectively present in these parables suggest the passing of considerable time before Christ's return. The conclusion that emerges then is that although Jesus proclaimed his return as imminent, he also allowed for a considerable time to elapse before its occurrence. We also understand that different things also must first occur. In the book of Revelation, it says, we have the, the verse where it says, the martyrs cry, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before thou wilt judge and avenge our blood? The answer they receive is simply to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete. The latter process presupposes a waiting period which could be rather long. The New Testament pretends, presents the second coming of Christ, imminent and yet possibly distant. How can this tension be resolved? The problem is not only how to interpret apparent contradictory texts, but also how to live in the consciousness of the nearness of Christ's coming while accepting the possibility of a long waiting time. When we look at the, the New Testament and see what the um, apostles or the disciples wrote, especially Paul and Peter, even though they were confident that Jesus was going to come in their time, there was no great disappointment when he didn't come. And I think the great disappointment, as the Millerite movement experienced, is when we start setting dates and times. That's when we become disappointed. A crisis of faith in Christ's return can only occur if such a faith is based on presumption and of knowing a date of his second coming. Our waiting time as we go through into another year, how should that be or how should we conduct ourselves? And if we think that our waiting time for the second coming of Jesus, which again is nearer than when these verses were wrote, uh, should be as that of a lover, a lover's time. And I'm sure that we all, most of us know what that means. When we're in love, time just seems to fly by and we can't be together enough of the time. Lover's time is a time which exists in the world of love and it's measured not by the clock, but by love and faith. In the world of love, time is real, but it flies. The person who waits only for chronicle time to pass finds such time to be unbearably slow. And it's true, isn't it? I remember as a child going to school, waiting for the, for the bell to ring in the afternoon. It seemed to take ages, in fact, all day. On the other hand, the person who also experiences time in reference to a beloved person finds that time does, in fact, rush by. Of Jacob, it is said that he served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. The notion of existence, uh, sorry, the notion of uh, time expressed in a love relationship can help us resolve the biblical tension between the nearness and the remoteness of Christ's return. Because the event expected is not something impersonal, but rather the personal return of our Saviour, of our loved, beloved Lord. The second advent is the occasion to see face to face the one whom now we see in a mirror dimly. This hope to see the return of the beloved Lord enables the believer to live in the expectancy of his imminent return while open to the possibility of a long waiting period. Two persons who love one another have reason to hope to see one another soon, even if the separation is to be chronologically rather long. When a love relationship exists between the believer and Christ, uh, believing in and hoping for his imminent return becomes a natural necessity. To accept the present salvation that Christ offers us without believing in his imminent return would like become becoming engaged without even getting married. The believer who has already experienced 
the invisible and yet real presence and power of Christ has ever every reason to live in the joyful expectation of the imminent visible appearing. The time experienced in the love relationship enables us to understand the significance of such words of Jesus as those recorded in John 16:16. 16, 16. A little while and you will see me no more. Again, a little while and you will see me. But as by describing the time that would elapse between his departure and return as a little while, Christ was not informing his disciples uh, on chronology, but rather he was assuring them of the certainty of their future reunion. In other words, Christ was speaking not of a clock time, but again of a lover's time. The waiting time mentioned by Christ is a little while, not because it would consist of only a few years, but because during his absence we can in live intensively in reality of his love and certainty of his return. A short waiting time may seem like an eternity when one lives in fear and uncertainty. On the other hand, years may seem like days when lived intensively and serenely in the certainty of the love of the expected person. Thus, the love relationship that exists between Christ and the believer makes it possible to live in the expectation of the imminent return of Christ while open to the possibility of a long waiting time. <clears throat> Another view is the second advent is near because the believer already enjoys a foretaste of its blessings and privileges made possible through the first advent. Having already experienced through the indwelling spirit a taste of the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, Hebrews 6.5, the believer lives in the expectancy of the imminent consummation of salvation. When we look at the Lord's Prayer, it also provides us another example of how the New Testament reconciles the tension between the nearness and the distance of the kingdom. The prayer opens with a petition, Thy kingdom come, and closes with simply, for thine is the kingdom. The distance between the two is measured primarily not by space and time, but such specific concerns as the accomplishments, accomplishments of God's will, the gift of daily bread, the forgiveness of sin, and the deliverance from the evil one. Even the Lord's Supper, the unity of the Advent hope, is expressed especially vividly through the symbolic significance of the Lord's Supper. The drinking of the cup and the partaking of the bread are viewed as a proclamation of the Lord's death till he comes. The, dis the distance between the passion and the advent hope is shortened because the two events are seen as inseparable. When partaking of the Lord's Supper, the believer accepts symbolically the present salvation which is both past and future. Passion and the advent hope may be far away in terms of time, yet it is near in terms of salvation time because its reality is already a present certainty and experience. There is an essential unity among the events of the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the heavenly ministration and second advent. This unity enables New Testament believers to reconcile the apparent tension between the imminent and the distance of the second advent. advent. What is the same expected saviour who has already appeared and who is presently appearing before the Father on our behalf who will ultimately will appear the second time to save those who eagerly await him. And this is our prayer uh, for each and every one of us that we are ready Marianne came home one day frustrated with, a, with an expression from her boss, how he, he mocked basically what she believed in. But the Bible talks about in the last days we will have scoffers, we will have mockers, but we have a wonderful hope that Jesus will be here soon. For some of the people that we've laid to rest, he has already come. But for us, there's an there's a urgency that we're ready for when he comes. And I want you all to be there as uh, I want to be there too, and we wish you God's blessing and speed
through the new year. Thank you. Heavenly Father, it is with thankful hearts that we can come to you today, Lord. And Heavenly Father, as we leave our, uh, the sanctuary of this church today, we pray that as we step out into a new week, that you'll be especially with each and every one of us. Heavenly Father, please continue to give us the strength to be true disciples of you. Help us to daily surrender our lives to you, Father. And please give us the opportunity to always talk to those people about the hope that is in us. Keep those who are on holiday, Lord, safe. And may you bless each and every one at camp today. Father, we also thank you for the people in this congregation that have helped make this service possible today. And we just pray that you're with each and every one of us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.